بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ومن ولا. So we didn't meet last week. Um, I'm sorry about that. I was out of the country. Uh, but where we left off two weeks ago, we were having a conversation on uh, wudu. Um, does anybody remember the verse from the Quran? Which one it was that we looked at that talked about wudu? Yeah, close. Really good. Six. Verse eight, yeah. It was verse six. Do people want to pull that up? If you have it on your phone, or if you have like a copy, and the translation is fine. We'll work with the translation. Yeah. Can you read it out loud? Man? You who believe, when you're about to pray, wash your faces and your hands and your arms up to your elbows. Wipe your heads. Wash your feet up to your ankles. And if required, wash your whole body. That's fine. So this was the verse that became the base of the performance of wudu. And what we were hoping to do today is just go through an actual process, with like water in front of me, through a bucket. I'm like super jet lag, just so you know. And um, I'm gonna ask somebody to volunteer. I'm not gonna like wash you. You will like wudu yourself, essentially. Um, but just so we could go through it step by step and we can understand the actual process that's there. What you want to understand about this as a practice is that it's its own ritual in Islam, right? So a couple of weeks ago, we introduced two terms. We talked about ibadah, which is worship, right? And that there's two broader categories um, that we study when you're studying like legal rulings in Islam. You study what are called ibadat, the worship, you know, your prayer and fasting and charity, etc. And then you have mu'amalat, which are like kind of your interactions with the people around you, so to speak. Um, in the early part of Islam, before anything was mandated, we have in our tradition narration that the angel Gabriel, peace be upon him, comes to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, while he is in Mecca, and he teaches him how to pray, like our ritual prayer. And probably in like a week or two, we'll start talking about the ritual prayer. But in this instance, before the angel Gabriel shows the Prophet how to pray, he teaches him how to make wudu first. Right, so the very first ritual practice that the Prophet Muhammad is taught and that he performs is arguably the act of wudu. At that time, wudu and prayer are not mandated in the ways that we see them mandated in Medina. So if you remember, we talked some weeks ago that the actual community is established in Medina that allows now for certain things to happen that couldn't happen in Mecca, where they didn't have a base, they were persecuted. And so in Mecca, when the Prophet is taught how to pray, both for himself, but for others at that time, because there's verses in the Quran that talk about prayer that were revealed in Mecca, these are like recommended prayers. They're like extra prayers. They're not obligatory prayers. Right, so you want to start to piece together the words that we've been talking about, right? Obligation, the word farud, right? Something that is recommended, mustahab, an established prophetic practice, sunnah mu'akkada, something that is disliked, makru, something that is impermissible, strictly prohibited, religiously haram. So the prayers that the people were praying in Mecca in the very beginning. They weren't obligatory prayers. These were just extra prayers that they were doing. But the angel Gabriel came and taught the Prophet Muhammad how to perform the prayer. And before that, he showed him how to make wudu, how to wash up for the prayer. 
Because a prerequisite for the validity of the prayer is that you have a state of ritual purity, which is wudu. So if I didn't have wudu, I just used the restroom, you know, I was asleep for the night and I woke up and I said, I'm just going to pray without making wudu. Somebody could say to me, well, that doesn't count. It's not valid. Its validity necessitates the prerequisite state of wudu. And these aren't things to kind of be mechanical about alone, but the mechanics are important to it. And there was one anecdote that we discussed that came from the prophetic tradition that involved the two grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them all, Hassan Hussein, where they see an older companion who is making mistakes in wudu. And so they seek to teach him, but with some etiquette. This is their elder. So one says to the other, let's pretend like we're having a competition, ask him to judge who makes wudu the best. And in the course of that, one of them makes the mistake. They start to go back and forth on it. And at the end, the elder companion, he is grateful to them that they have taught him something without necessarily taking away some of his dignity, right? There's a certain wisdom to giving counsel that's there. But one of the things that was there was that this is also a person who lived during the time of the Prophet and was making a mistake in the performance of the wudu. There's another narration where there is a man who is making wudu and he's got his foot leaning against the ground as the water is pouring, right? They didn't have running water the way that we're blessed to have running water when we make wudu. And so they would make wudu and they literally had like a wudu pot, right? Like a wudu, it didn't look like this. So it wasn't like this plastic neon, like whatever color this is, right? But there was a, a, a vessel that held the water and you want to conceptualize. If you've ever done this for yourself, washed up for prayer and you're washing limbs, Think about what you would do if you didn't have running water and you were doing this and there was like a cup, so to speak, that you were pouring the water out of. And so this person is making wudu and has got his foot on the ground as he is washing his foot, right? As we wash our feet when we make wudu. And, you know, we're going to go through the steps. And as the water is pouring on his foot, it doesn't get on the back of his ankle. And the prophet sees this, and he has the water go on the top part of his foot. It doesn't go towards the back of his ankle. And the prophet says to him, essentially like, that you gotta protect your ankles from the nod, from like the fire, right? You can't be careless or lax in this practice. Every single piece of the limbs that have to be washed or wiped have to be washed and wiped in full. It's not that you just go through it kind of carelessly or mechanically. It's a spiritual act. The prophetic tradition mentions a lot about wudu in and of itself, right? And we're just going to call it wudu because you want to familiarize yourself with some of the Arabic terminology one, because the English translations are just words we don't use. If you go in the hallway, the nice people who built us these wudu rooms call them ablution rooms, right? I have never said to anybody that, hey, what are you doing? And my response is, I'm abluting right now, right? It's not like a term that we utilize. Do you know what I mean? There's certain words that can carry over and should into multiple languages. Wudu is one of those words. Right? So, you just want to get familiar with it. I'm, gonna, I'm making my wudu. Right? I'm performing wudu. It's a spiritual act. The mechanics of it are attached to a spiritual element. In Islam as a tradition, everything falls into these categories that we talked about. If you remember when we discussed them, they're called the ahkam of sharia. Right? What's on this end? Haram. Right? This is... What does it mean? Yeah, it's 
strictly prohibited. What's over here? Fard. Some people will say wajib. This means obligatory. What's in the middle? No. Mubah. These are neutral acts. Most acts fall into this category. What's to the left of it? Makru is going to be over here. These are disliked. And yeah, mustahab. These are recommended. Sorry, my English is off. And then you can have like a branch here that is the sunnah muakkada. These are like confirmed practices of the Prophet. Right, and there's some nuance to this. All of this, theoretically, is what's permissible. On this side is what is not permissible. So there's a category that's haram, it's prohibited. The spiritual benefit of making wudu, what the prophetic tradition teaches us, is that as you wash each limb, you're essentially washing away the haram committed by those limbs. And you go in in a state of mindfulness, not in a state of anxiety, in a state where you have awareness and consciousness that the things that your hands have done that they should not have done. You're washing up to your limbs, your elbows, your face, what the eyes see. Literally, you want the water to hit every part because it's a spiritual cleansing of the things that your ears have he heard, right? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? There's narrations in our tradition that at the end of today, we didn't talk about Malik and Malik and Malik. We're talking about the names of God. And what we're trying to do is go through the first chapter of the Quran, Surah Fatiha, that many of you are going to like build a relationship with and memorize. So we talked about Rahman and Rahim, right? We talked about the word Rabb. And if you were not here for those sessions, you can look at the recordings, or I could talk to you and we can meet later. And so one of the next verses in that chapter says, Maliki Omidin, the master of the Day of Judgment. The Day of Judgment is a theological kind of belief that we have. Remember in day one we said, there's three things that you believe in theologically that make you Muslim. Right? Pure monotheism, there's one God. The finality of prophethood and the prophet Muhammad and an afterlife, right? And things that stem from these things. So one of the spiritual consequences of wudu is that on the day of judgment, the people who perform wudu, they are going to have their limbs like glistening and shining. They're going to stand bright on the day of judgment amongst the companions and the the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that it literally like becomes a source of light and this is derived from our prophetic tradition and you have then mentioned in the hadith as well like Arabic is really beautiful as a language English is also really beautiful, like if we spoke it in a beautiful way, right? In Arabic, when you have like descriptions of the people on the Day of Judgment, one of the ways the Prophet ﷺ describes the people who make their wudu on the Day of Judgment, he calls them Al-Ghur. And then he follows that with Al-Muhajjaloon. The word ghur in Arabic refers to a horse. That, if any, do any of you ride horses or have familiarity with horses? We're from New York City. Has anybody seen a horse before? You know what a horse is? Yeah, yeah, great. Only a few people are nodding their heads. So a horse is an animal that, essentially the ghur is a specific type of horse that it's not one color but going down the front of its face is this kind of light streak that breaks apart the rest of the color. 
And it's noted amongst horses as just having this distinct beauty to it, right? It creates like this regalness to it. If you've ever seen a horse that's like this, and al-muhajjalun are then referring to other streaks that are going across the horse's body that add to its majesticness and its beauty. And this is what the people on the Day of Judgment are being described as who make wudu. That in reference to their limbs, their faces, the way that there's a certain striking nature of luminosity that comes from the wudu and its performance, the spiritual consequence is that there's just going to be light emanating from every limb of the persons who perform their wudu with a certain level of accuracy and treated it as it was actually a spiritual act and why these two hadith are important that we talked about is you don't want to get to a place where you are mindless in an act that necessitates mindfulness for spiritual gain some of us could go and sit in a bathroom any type of sink and even those of you who are just familiarizing yourself with the practice, you're going to get to a point where it's going to just come like this. You could perform your wudu in seconds. The whole idea is to be in a state of self-control that says, I don't want to perform it in seconds. Those of you who are learning how to perform wudu for the first time, and the certain care that you have and kind of the sense of I'm gonna pull out my notes and go through it you want to have that same endearment every time you perform will do and get to a place where it actually is not seen only in connection to your prayer because it's so much more than that it's its own spiritual act it's its own practice its own ritual does that make sense so we talk about the different elements now to wudu before we do a walkthrough. There's going to be certain ones that fit into the category of what is obligatory. <laughs> so I was, just bear with me. <laughs> so there's going to be obligatory. We're going to have what is uh, confirmed sunnah, right? This is what the Prophet salam, did. And then you're going to have another breakdown of what is recommended. And then things that are disliked. Okay. Does anybody remember what we said was from the fard last time? Just straight out the verse that we looked at. Yeah. Ankles. Your ankles. Great. So let's put ankles down here. You're going to wash your feet up to the ankles. What else? You're going to wash your face. Anything else? Huh? I can't hear. I'm sorry. Hands. Hands? Yeah. So the hands are going to go in this category. But we're looking at what's obligatory, like from just from that verse, the sixth verse of the fifth chapter. Your head. Huh? Your head. Your head. I guess you can include the hands and the arms because it's a part of your hands. So sorry about that. Yeah. Hands, arms. These are what's going to be like obligatory. You have to do this. This is the minimum. We don't want to aspire towards the minimum. You want to be in a place though, where as you learn this, you learn its components because there will be times where you have to adapt and you can't 
forego it as a practice because it's necessary to perform your prayer, right? So you want to know what are the base minimums of the performance of this so you can get through it. So the obligatory aspects of it, you're going to wash the whole face. Remember last time I said, like, we're trying to, what the people would do when they read these verses, they would try to define what does these words mean, right? So the face in our tradition goes from your forelock, the top of your forehead, to the bottom of your chin, and it's going to go to where your ears begin. A lot of people, when they make wudu, they miss this part of their face. You're going to do the whole part of your face. Right? And you're washing the face. So you take water in your hands and you're going to have the water wash over your face, which is different from wiping. And we'll contrast it because you wipe the head, but you wash the face. Does it make sense? Are we sure? Yes? Yeah? Great. So this whole thing is your face, right? This is my face. If I have a beard, you see my beard is kind of, I don't know how long this is, right? But if you have a beard, you're going to also need to get into like the bottom of the beard, so to speak, right? But we're talking about the base elements that are obligatory. So the face in its entirety, the top of your forehead to the bottom of your chin to where the ears start, your earlobes. Does it make sense? Okay. Then from there, you're going to wash the arms up to your elbows. This is a second obligatory part of the wudu. So from finger to elbow. And washing is a specific thing that has to be defined. Washing isn't you take water and you rub it on your arm, but the water is flowing over your arm. And we're going to talk about the rubbing aspect to this when we get to like what goes into the recommended and confirmed, but the water has to flow over it in its entirety. And you're going to go from the tip of your finger to up to and including your elbow. There's a narration where a companion of the Prophet, his name is Abu Huraira, radiallahu an. Right? He's called Abu Huraira because he had a love for cats. And it's embedded in his name, Huraira. Abu Huraira, he heard the hadith that we talked about, that your limbs would be light, they would be illuminated on the day of judgment. So one day a person saw him, and when he was wiping his arm, he would wash his arm and go all the way up to his armpits. And the person said, like, what are you doing? He was like, I didn't know you could see me. Had I known you could see me, I would have just stopped at my elbow. But he said, I heard the prophet say that you're going to be like essentially illuminated your body parts on the day of judgment based off of how you wash them. And I wanted more of me to be lit up. This isn't like what our practice is. Do you know what I mean? He's doing his own what's called ijtihad. But that's not what is the norm. But like he took it that seriously. Do you get what I'm saying? Right? So when you're engaged now with your hands, what you want to do is ensure that each part of it is being washed and everything that can be a block on your arms is also being removed. Right? I cannot do a washing of my arm over the sleeve of my shirt. Right? So I'm going to have to expose my arm for it. The rings that I'm wearing, they're super tight on my fingers, right? I got some fat. Somebody told me today when I was in the elevator, they were like, you know, they're like, how is Turkey? And I said, oh, you know, it's very hard. It was very difficult. And we were talking about, and well, I'll make things easy for the people of Turkey and Syria. And somewhere along the lines in the conversation, it got to like my rest and my eating. And she said, well, you look like you're very well fed, right? I was like, you sound fat. Like, what are you talking about? I was like, yeah, I know I'm fat. That's okay. So I got fat fingers, right? Because the rest of me is fat. So my hands are fat. So my rings are not going to have the water go through them. So when I'm washing it, are you laughing at me? Yeah? 
Stuck for the last sister. I'll have to give you. You take off your rings. You can't take off anything else. It's not, a, it's not meant to be like a game, right? You don't want to have laziness in it. It's a spiritual act. So the best thing, just take off the stuff. Don't let it prevent water from hitting any part of it. Its validity necessitates that even if you're doing the minimum, the water has to hit those parts in full. You get what I mean? Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions on that? So when you're going now through the arm up to and including the elbow, if you don't know where your elbow is, right? Where it starts and where it stops, just go above it a little bit. You know what I mean? Abu Huraira went all the way up to his armpit. You don't have to do that, and you shouldn't do that. And he was specific in telling his companion, this is not from the Sunnah. I'm just doing it for this reason. Meaning like, you don't need to do this. That's not how we do it. But just to illustrate the point, the idea isn't to just go halfway up, like go up in full and make sure the whole thing is getting washed. When we do this, we're gonna show you in a little bit, but you're gonna pour it over your arm and then have the arm, like your hand is gonna rub over it so that the water is going where it needs to go, yeah? The obligatory part of the head in the Hanafi school, which is what we're basing this off of, is a quarter of the head at a minimum. We're talking about the minimum. One-fourth of the head, right? So your head is not the largest thing in the world. You know what I mean? Right? If this is your face, your head is going to start where your face stops, right? So now you're thinking about this because we had this as a conversation the last couple of weeks ago, right? Like, you know, I cover my head, but I don't wear a hijab the way a woman wears a hijab. And you're all like, kind of, you know, and you're in a bathroom, people are looking at you. When you are understanding now that there's a minimum that's there, in certain settings, the default is that you should do what is going to be incorporated in the second and third column that we're going to get to in a bit. But where you have a valid reason as to why you are going to only do what is the minimum requirement, then the minimum requirement still renders validity. You get what I mean? You don't want to get stuck in this mess where somebody says to you, well, this doesn't count. It counts. You have to understand that. In other legal schools, it's even less than a quarter of a head, right? In the Hanafi school, it's a fourth of your head that you're wiping now. This is not washing. The washing is the flow of the water. The wiping is you're going to take just like fingers from your hands, three fingers. You're going to take the water on it and it's going to just wipe over the head till the back. Some people would say then you take the index fingers of your hands, you put them in your ears, you take your thumb and wash over, wipe over your head, the back of your fingers, right? Because you use the front of them when going over, the back of them you put on your neck, and that constitutes it in the second and third column, which we'll reiterate in a bit. But at a minimum, you're just wiping over a fourth of your head. I take some water, I got water in my hand, just pie my head, and then you're done. So you got a scarf on your head, and you're stuck in a place that is not built for wudu, right? Then you can just very easily, in the back of your head, in the front of your head, it still renders validity. Does that make sense? Yes? And then you're going to wash the feet uh, all the way up to your ankles, right? If you don't have familiarity with the parts of your body that set now the boundaries, you want to spend some time like thinking about these things. Do you know what I mean? Like if you've never looked at your feet before, look at your foot and see where does the ankle start? Where does the ankle stop? The front end of your foot is not that hard to deduce because you're 
got some toes on your feet, you know where it, it starts. You just got to make sure that you're getting to the end point, which is the top of your ankle, its entirety. You get what I mean? Does that make sense? Right? It's a part of the practice. If you ask me why, I don't, I don't know. You know? I couldn't tell you why, like, the practice is about washing these parts of your body and not washing other parts of your body. Fundamentally, it's the same as why do we pray three rakahs at Maghrib and not like 14 rakahs at, I don't know. You know what I mean? This is how the act was designed. This is how Allah created for us this gift of wudu that is a very unique practice that its execution renders now that spiritual gain by performing it in the way that it was intended to be performed. Does that make sense? So these four parts are not just water on my face. I'm going to rub it down. Your face is from what part of your head to what part of your head? What constitutes your face? From the hairlines on your chin. Yep. Great. And where does it, what about in the other direction? Earlobe to earlobe, right? Pay it, when you go make wudu, at any point in the near future, just pay attention to it, you know? Because when you get stuck in this and it's just mechanical, you're gonna notice probably, sometimes you're not going all the way that it needs to go, and at that point, its validity is not complete, right? It needs to go to its entire kind of extension. Does that make sense? The arms, what do we do with the arms? Yep, yeah, great. And when we do the head, what do we do? And the last one, the ankles. Great. Any questions on this? These are what are obligatory. Now we're going to get to what goes into the confirmed aspects of this. So before you're even washing anything now, one of the things that are a confirmed practice is that you maintain the order that is here. Meaning, you do it sequentially. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, The number of times is not an obligation. Okay. And the order in the Hanafi school is not an obligation. So if you do it once, like these things, it's complete. The minimum is one time. You can't get away with doing it less than one time, right? If you don't do it fully and you do it not at all, these things, then it doesn't count. You see, does that make sense, right? When you're taught how to do it, you're gonna do it this way, including the three times and everything else that like someone is, if they've ever explained it to you, because this is the way the prophet did it. There's no reason to not do it this way unless there's an actual reason to only do it like this, right? So like the example I gave to you, I have students that call me from Central Park, they're sledding in the snow, Maghrib time is upon them, they have to like make wudu, what are they gonna do, right? Are they gonna like do the minimums or are they gonna do what's full? They're gonna be gargling with snow in their mouth and shoving snow in their nostrils and blowing. No, like you're not gonna do that, right? But if you don't know that you don't know how to do that, you're gonna sit there in the snow and be like, what am I supposed to do? And you're gonna shove snow in your face, 
right? Does, that doesn't make sense, right? And this is where knowing fic is not just like a boring science, but it teaches you to be more cerebral about your practice, to be able to bring your brain as well as your spiritual heart into it so that you know how to adapt in certain circumstances and situations. Do you get what I mean? When I'm trying to make wudu in Turkey in what looks like a war zone, there's no water anywhere. What am I supposed to do? And we're handing out bottles of water to people. We're going to tell them you got to use that to make wudu. And if they did use it, are they going to do this? There's guys, man, subhanAllah, that were under the rubble of these buildings. And people have found them. And the prayer times came. They're still praying as they're stuck under the rubble. And as people are trying to bring them out, they're helping them. And they're saying, bring me water for wudu. And other people are saying, you're stuck under a building, dude. Just make tayammum. We'll talk about tayammum in another session where if you don't have water, there's other restrictions, you can use like earth or dirt, right? And they're saying, just do that. And they're like, no, I'm going to pray like the way I'm supposed to pray, right? I mean, it's crazy the level of commitment they have and the just state of iman that these people have. May Allah increase them just to see it and experience that. And I was at Tandon yesterday doing a halakha, and they asked me to talk a little bit about this. And I said to them, I was like, with real love, these people are doing this in that situation. How does it make sense that you can't tell a professor that you have to get up to go and pray? You know, you can't tell your boss that you got to go to Juma. And it's subjective. It definitely is. But the root of this is where we started in the beginning. All of it has to go back to God. And you have to know who God is to you and build a relationship with God and then understand that this is an act of worship that is meant to bring you closer to God and to find strength then through that intentionality. Does that make sense? Okay. Other things that are going to happen as you go through this as a process that you don't want to have like excessive pause in between each of these things. Right? So it's not like, hey, you know, I washed my face this morning, then I had some cornflakes, and then I just went and washed my arms and everything else. That's not how it works, right? Like, you got to do everything with, like, kind of a, a, a sequential, like, it's, a, it's an, an entirety, like, a practice. You see what I mean? It's not like I wash this part, and then 30 minutes later I wash this. There's not a reason as to why you would separate certain things, then you don't separate them. And reasons that there would be separation. Like you ran out of water. Do you know what I mean? If I have a wudu bucket and my wudu bucket ran out of water, you know, Khalid and I are making wudu at the same wudu bucket. I'm not doing it at the same time necessarily, but we're sharing. We're friends. And I made wudu and then he made it after and I didn't leave enough water for him. And he got now to the place where he wiped over his head and he looks in here. He's like, there's no water for my feet. And then he goes and walks and gets some more water. And that process takes him some time. Then that's a valid reason to pause, right? Meaning when you're sitting in the wudu room and somebody walks in that you ain't see for the last like 10 minutes of your life, you don't submit, you don't interrupt your wudu. And have like a full-blown conversation and then go back to your wudu. It's similar to if you were in your prayer and then you just jumped out of prayer because somebody walked in and then you just jump back into your prayer. You don't do that, right? You got to treat wudu the same way. So when you're in your wudu, there's no pause. There's just a washing successively of all the limbs. And then one of the other things that you maintain throughout it is that you're rubbing the limbs. That are being washed. Right and washing again is different from wiping. Right. So 
the wiping, you're not like rubbing your head because it's a wiping, but the ones that are being washed, you're going to rub those. So here now, you're going to make an intention that is going to be rooted in the act in and of itself. That you're performing wudu, this is a mechanism to take you out of a state of ritual impurity into a state of ritual purity. It's an act of worship, it's an act of ibadah, right? You're going to make an explicit intention attached to the performance of the act itself. And then here is where you wash the hands up to the wrist. As Angie was saying, like, how does that factor into this? And when you're doing that, the practice that we have when it comes to our, our hands and our feet is that you're going to reinforce that water went through each part of them by having your digits go in between like the opposite hand's fingers. Do you get what I mean? Right, so that we know that water is getting into each of these parts, right? Anything that's a block is going to prevent the water, right? Like, I think Chrissy asked this two weeks ago about kind of wearing makeup. The idea isn't that the makeup in and of itself is problematic, but if you have something that's a barrier of any kind, right? I'm wearing my ring and the water does not go through under the ring, then the wudu is not complete. So if you got nail polish on your fingers and the water is not going through it, then the water doesn't go through it. And that's just what it is. Do you see? You're going to, after you do your hands, you're gonna rinse your mouth three times. And this goes to the back of your throat. My handwriting is so bad. I don't even know what I wrote here, man. <laughs> back of throat. <laughs> Meaning you're going to gargle. Because you're rinsing out the full mouth. And this is where the recommendation is. Like, it's sunnah to use what's called the miswak. Does anybody know what a miswak is? Huh? It's a tooth stick. It's a wooden toothbrush. It's a, it's, a, it's a piece of wood that you soak it and you see sometimes people will like clean their teeth with it. Are you going to get one? Yeah. 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 He either ran out. <laughs> What's going on? Um, if you can't use like a miswak, you'll put your finger in your mouth and kind of rub on your teeth, right? You could use like a toothbrush. Yeah. Sorry, so miswak is part of the wudu? It's one of the confirmed sunnas. Okay. So it's not the obligations, right? We moved past the obligation, and now we're talking about confirmed sunnas. So the Prophet ﷺ would use miswak a lot, and he actually has a hadith where he says that if I didn't think it would be difficult for you, I, you know, because he didn't want people to think it was an obligation, right? That every time they were in this place, yeah, is this a miswak? You want to show people? <laughs> you want to pass it around? It's clean. It's dry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. If you use the miswak, as part of your routine, how do you, because um, since you're going to maybe make more than multiple times a day, how do you make sure that? It dries out enough for it to remain sanitary. Well, so when you soak a miswak, right? Like you can't just stick the, the stick in your mouth, right? We're passing it around, but you see it's hard. You got to like, like loosen it up and soak it up. You can put it in a cup of water and then it's going to like peel. And the bristles of it are what you're going to use to clean your mouth, right? And just as it starts to get utilized, it's a stick, like it's a twig, 
So you can cut it down, you know? And then you use the next part to it, and the next part. And you can get like all kinds of miswaks these days. Yeah, big ones. You get huge ones. They got like flavored miswak, you know. But the idea is that you're cleaning your mouth, right? This is the norm that's gonna happen. This is done other than, for example, when you are fasting and you are still making wudu, but when we walk through it, right, you're gonna gargle, you know, and kind of gargle in the back of your throat. When you're fasting, you would leave out the gargling so as to not take a chance to swallow the water. Do you know what I mean? You can still rinse out your mouth, but you don't go all the way to the back so that there's a caution that you don't swallow any of it. Does that make sense? Then after that, you're gonna do, you're gonna rinse your nose three times. All of this so far hasn't started any of this yet. Does that make sense? So everything that we've listed so far falls into like the sunnah mu'akkadah, the confirmed prophetic practices around wudu. This is what you want to do, but if there's a reason as to why you keep it at a minimum, then you would keep it at a minimum. Do you have a question? Yes. Concerning the use of the miswak, I've heard that it's sunnah to use it before you pray, like before your prayer begins. Is it also a sunnah to do it as part of your wudu, like as you're going through the wudu? Yeah, like when you're rinsing out your mouth. You to do it then? Yeah, you would do it at that point in time, right? If you don't have miswak, you don't, you know, use, use it or know how to use it, use your finger, right, to like kind of clean. You have a toothbrush at home, right? Just clean out your toothbrush. If you don't have it, like you don't, you don't have to use it. You know, you still do is rinse out your mouth, right? Yeah. So if you vigorously swish the water around your mouth and don't gargle, is it still valid? Like, yeah, because yeah. this is all from, the validity is based off of this, right? None of this that we've written so far is listed here, right? So for it to be valid, this is the minimum that's there. One time, and we spelled it out a little bit, what your actual face is, to what extent you're going up to your elbows, you're gonna wipe you know, at least a quarter of your head and feet up to the ankles, right? So we're adding all of these things now, right? These are confirmed sunnas. What you're gonna do, I'm gonna write here now, Okay, just so we're getting out of space. Everybody's good with this on the obligatory side? Yeah? Yeah, you can take a picture. Yeah, go ahead. What do you do if you're wearing socks and you're at work and there is no basin that you can... We're going to talk about that in a bit. Yeah. You got it? Yes, thank it's you. also all in this video that's being recorded. Yeah. For the order, do we do everything in the confirmed sunnah column before? Yeah, all of this happens before you get to here. Okay? So, this is just now a continuity of here. And we're going to talk about what you do with the face. So, now you're going to do the face, you're going to wash it three times. Right? And it's the same thing. Four lock bottom of the chin, earlobe to earlobe. This constitutes the face, right? A lot of people, especially guys, they miss this part right here if you have facial hair. Because for some reason, you just, and you can't, you're not supposed to like slap your face. We'll talk about that when we do what's makru, right? Meaning like, you're not taking the water and then it's like going like this, right? You know, you're like washing your face. Do you see the difference, right? You take water and you just, smack it in your face. That doesn't, that doesn't count, right? My son Kareem, mashallah, he's got like this little water resistant book that says my first will do book. My daughter uses it, Kareem uses it, and you know, he'll take, he'll, he'll, it's, and each picked page is a giant picture of your body part. And then it's got the, like it says face in big letters in case you couldn't tell. 
And then he's got the water running. He's looking at it very, you know, mashallah, seriously. Then he takes the water. He's like, smacks his face. I'm like, dude, you're going to hurt yourself, man. You punch yourself in the nose, man. And he's like, he's like, Baba, I'm making wudu. Don't talk when you make wudu. Like, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So you're going to also, if you have facial hair, you're going to take wet fingers and pass it through your beard. One time is obligatory. So now we're talking about, I just, I took these, let's remove this. This is just continued here, because we have this written. So this step follows this. This is supposed to be an arrow. <laughs> so we're moving from here to here now. So after I rinse my nose three times, I'm going to wash my face three times. And if I have facial hair, I'm going to take wet fingers and rub it through my beard so that it's getting to like the root of my skin. With your arms, You're going to also do this three times. Starting from the tips of your fingers to the top of your elbow. When you get to your head, right? What did we say was the minimum for the head when it was obligatory? A quarter. A quarter, right? So here, you're gonna do the whole head, but this is a wiping. So you're gonna take the water, and you're gonna wipe over the head in its entirety with no new water, right? You're gonna go, I just got a marker all over the back of my head. You're gonna take water, you're gonna go over your head in its entirety, and with the same water, you're gonna go in the inner part of your ear, the earlobe, and then the back of your neck, and that you're doing just once. Does it make sense? And then for your feet, you're going to wash three times and you're going to have water go through the toes. How do you do that? Well, the way we did it with our hands was that we put the fingers in between like, you know, the hands respectively. With your feet, what you're going to do is, I'm so old guys, I can't even get my feet up. So starting with your right foot, you're going to take your little finger and you're going to put it in between each of your toes, right? So the water gets into each, between each of your toes. Does that make sense? Yeah? And you're going to go all the way up to your ankles. These are all like confirmed sunnah practices. This is the way the Prophet ﷺ made his wudu. This is how you would make your wudu. There's going to be some nuanced differences in different legal schools of thought. All of them have their evidences. All of them have a basis, right? This is according to the Hanafi school. According to the Hanafi school, you should make your wudu like this unless there's a reason as to why you can't do that. Being lazy is not a good reason, right? You are going to deprive yourself of the increase that comes from spiritual exercise being done the way that it was intended to be done. You have a question? I do. Yeah, go ahead. Question. So, one, does it matter from what side to what side you uh, do the digits of the toes? You're going to start from your right foot, like in between your pinky toe, your little toe, and then work your way left. To your left foot ending at your pinky toe. Okay. Yeah. And the second question, if you have long hair, how do you reach the back of your neck if you're just going? So if you have a lot of hair on your head, right, the same idea. You're going to get to the roots of your, but it's wiping, right? So you're just wiping over your head, right? It's different than if you have a beard because on your face, you're washing the face, right? But on the head, you're just wiping the head. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, just to be clear, according to the Hanafi school, is it a confirmed sunnah to also clean the nose? Yeah, we're going to talk about that right now. Yeah. Um, so when do you interlock the fingers? Is it when you're cleaning your, washing your hands? Right in the beginning. When you're washing your arm? Wash the hands oh, up okay. to the wrist. Okay. So is the first, after you make your intention, yeah. you're going to wash your hands up to your wrist. And then you interlock. Like, mm -hmm. Now yeah. when you're cleaning your arms, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're washing the, like, the arm in like, the obligatory stage, can you in, are you allowed to interlock hands to get between the fingers to wash that specific arm or no? You know what I mean? Yeah, you should wash. You should interlock your hands. Okay. Even yes. when you're washing your arms. Even when you're washing the right arm, you interlock the left hand in to get. You were saying just if you were doing the bare minimum. No, no, no. I mean, like, well, I mean, I'm just saying it when we're washing the arms three times, just washing the right arm, like let's say the first time, and I want to like, I just I finish. The oh, you're saying when you get to here yeah, and you wash three times. Yeah, I would start from like the top of your hand again as well, and then go right? Down. And go up to your your elbow. But is the hand obligatory in that in with the arms? You've already washed your hands at that point, so it's not. So when you do your arms, the hand is not obligatory. Yeah, if you you did your hands here, so now you're washing your arms up to the elbow. You see, but you've already washed your hands. You see what I'm saying? You wash the hands. Yeah, I'm saying you should start from the tip of your yeah. finger and go to here, okay. right? But if you're asking, because you said when it's in an obligatory state, uh -huh. right? So when you're doing just the minimum, right? You still have to wash your hands as part of this process. Because yeah. you're going to go from the tip of your finger to the top of your elbow. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? If you are doing it like this, you're going to wash your hands up to your wrist in the very beginning. And then when you get here, you should do it again also, just because that's a part of like how we're doing it. You see what I mean? Yes. Yeah, so question about the ears also. Yeah. So like, do you have to like actually get water from like every part of the ear, or is it just like the like the ear like canal? No, because you're just you're you're wiping your head, so the ear at that point is a part of your head. So you're gonna take like your whatever finger this is, index mm -hmm. finger. It's going to go like in the inner part of your ear, right? So like this, uh -huh. you're going to take your thumb and rub it on the back side of your ear. So you just rotate the finger? Yeah. You don't have to it. actually hit like literally every part of the ear. You're not getting new water, yeah. right? So whatever water remains on your hand, you're putting it in the inner part of your ear, uh -huh. right? Whatever goes in, everyone's ear is shaped differently, right? And then with your thumb, you're going to rub on the outer part of it. And then with the back of your hands, you're going to wipe your neck. Does that make sense? Yeah. So as we go into the recommended acts now, one of the recommended acts when you're making wudu is that you're going to face towards the Kaaba, right? But you don't have to. It's not a confirmed sunnah, right? So this is now that mustahab kind of category, right? So facing in the direction of the Kaaba, you go to our wudu rooms, they don't face the direction of the Kaaba. The, you know, it's not the same as when you're praying, like you face the Kaaba when you pray, right? When you're making wudu, you don't have to, nor is it a confirmed sunnah, but it's one of the recommendations when you're making wudu, right? Just like when you make du'a, we can sit here right now, you're facing this way, I'm facing that way, we can make du'a, but it's recommended when you're making du'a that you're in a state of wudu and you're facing towards the, the Qibla, towards the Kaaba. It's not though something that like, is it's it's not the same as a sunnah mu'akkada you see what i mean so these are recommended acts they're mustahab if you do them there's blessing in it if you leave it behind it doesn't invalidate or decrease like the benefit of what it is that you're doing yeah other things that are recommended in this that i'm just going to read through you're going to avoid splashing water on yourself right so the idea is like there's uh, in the Quran you're going to see the word Israf a lot it means like extravagance wastefulness right and quite often it is rooted in an explanation of like spending money superfluously it's also about like just wasting water you know we're, we're not supposed to be wasteful in any way you know what I mean so you don't want like making wudu is not I get in front of the sink you know and I turn the water on and then I start like rolling up my sleeves and I'm like, undo my scarf. 
You just lost like three gallons of water, right? There's not mindfulness there. Do you know what I mean? Like you use the wudu water to make wudu. You don't waste as a part of it. So you don't want to like to avoid splashing the water. on oneself. This is just more about being measured, right? You're not like just dousing yourself with the water, but you're in a place where you are uh, just like conscious of what's going on. We're not going to talk about these here, but maybe I'll share them in a document with you. But as you go through the wudu, there are different uh, Invocations. As you wash like the different parts of your body. These are recommended like du'as to make as you're going through it. So now we're going to look at recommendations. So here when you have rinsing your mouth, it's going to be rinsing this with like three separate handfuls of water. And this is where the recommended practice comes when you're talking about your nose, that you insert the water with your right hand and you take out the water with your left hand All right so I'm going to take the water I'm going to you know put it in my nose with my right hand and I'm going to blow it out with my left hand coming out All right this is a recommended act as you're putting water into your mouth. I've seen people where they take a scoop and they like do both at the same time. That's pretty crazy. How do they do that? I don't know, but that's not what you're talking about. You're saying through the I mouth know. and then the nose, three separate scoops also. Yeah, I'm not like, I don't know how, how did you do that? I'm going back and juggling huh? at the same time. That's crazy. You know how to do it? Is that why you're raising no, your hand? I'm not raising my hand. Yeah. <laughs> no, so you should just keep them as separate acts, Okay. right? Yeah, if somebody does, I don't know, right? And I said this before, I, I can't tell you like why someone else does what they do, but also you don't want to assume that the way they're doing it is not correct. I couldn't tell you if there's an opinion that says that's how you do it. And you just, you wanna be comfortable with the idea as hard as it is, because we have so much access to information online that there's like opinions on everything and spiritual maturity recognizes diverse opinions. Spiritual immaturity says that I know every opinion on everything. Do you know what I mean? So I, I don't know, like, and I'm sure there's a basis to it, but here you'd, you'd want to keep them as separate things, right? So you, you rinse out your mouth three times and you spit out the water, right? Three times. And then you're going to do your nose, right? Once, twice three times. Yeah? Make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is like a definition of like a wash, I guess. I'm really kind of curious. So like if you, does a wash mean like you take a new scoop of water and then you like, let's say like if I'm washing my right arm, I like fill my, I like cut my hand, fill it with water, like let it flow down the arm and then like wipe it all down and that counts as one. No, you're going to take water yeah. and you're going to pour it over your arm, right? And this is where like if you have assistance, you know, we have ease with this because we're rubbing, we have the utilization of two arms. Do you know what I mean? Right, so you, you don't want to make it harder for yourself, right? What I meant is like, as in like, does wash mean how many times you pass over a part of the arm, or as in how many scoops of like one scoop of water that you use that scoop to wash the whole arm? No, because they would have like a vessel that they're pouring the water out of. Uh -huh. So you're not scooping the water out when you're washing over the arm, you're pouring it over your arm. Do you know what I mean, right? And so as you pour it, you're rubbing it over your arm. Okay. Do you know? Does that make sense? So then if we pass the definition, what counts as washing? Like once, I guess. 
Washing is the water has to flow over the limb. The wiping is I take the water, right? And I'm just, whatever I have on my hand, I'm wiping over it. The only thing you do that with is when you're wiping over your head, like in general, right? We're gonna talk about some exceptions in a bit, but other than the wiping of your head, everything else is being washed in full, right? So you take the water for your, your, your mouth, it's gonna be like water in a handful. You put it, gargle, spit it out, right? Your nose, you put it, you rinse it out. You know what I mean? In your hands, right? You're gonna put it from forehead to chin, earlobe to earlobe. And it's not wiping in the same way, right? I'm wiping, I'm like going like this. I'm washing, like the water is kind of going all over my face. You see the difference? Yeah. Okay. You're going to have a recommendation that when you're washing your face, you're going to start from the forehead. It's a recommended practice. So you start from up here and then do like the rest of your face, right? And with the arms, you start washing from the fingertips. Um, <clears throat> from the head, a recommended practice is that you start wiping the head from the front and do all of the wiping with the same water. Uh, you wipe the outside of the ears with the thumb, like I said, the inside with the index fingers, and you'll have some different opinions on this and recommendations, but you can take the little finger and you stick that into like the hole of your ear, but not like so you're damaging your ear, right? Just like, you know, so it kind of gets in there. And then with the feet, you're going to start by washing from the tip of your toes, going up to your ankle. You rub with the left hand and pass the little finger through the toe, starting with the little toe of the right foot, ending with the little toe of the left foot is a recommended practice. But we use our left hands for some of these things versus our right hands. In our tradition, like there's designations for things, right? So you eat with your right hand, you know? So when you are washing like your feet, you're not going to wash your feet with the same hand you're eating with. Does that make sense? Right? And this is why like, there's specificity. Use your left hand um, when you're doing some of these. Some of the things that are disliked um, is like just talking without need. You know, so when you're making will do and you're sitting, and you're, you know, like we have a really nice community. People, you know, get along pretty well. You go to some places and Muslims look more angry than anything for whatever reason. But like, you know, you're making wudu. It's a spiritual act, right? You don't want to be rude to somebody. Somebody gives you salams, you respond to their salams. You know, that's fine. But while you're making wudu, it's definitely not the time that you want to just be talking about random things. You also don't want to be talking about haram, right? Like you're engaging in a spiritual purification. It's not the time to lie or gossip, you know? It's not the time like to be doing things that divert your attention from the act that's in front of you. So much about this religion is rooted in the ability to be present and to have kind of awareness of what's going on. Do you know what I mean? And this becomes a challenge, right? I talk to people who are older in their life all the time and they're like, I feel so embarrassed. I should already know this. Like little kids know it. The challenge when you learn this as a child is that you don't think about it as an adult then. You just learn it rotely and mechanically and then it becomes something that you do instinctively, but there's no kind of continuing education about what this means when you reach a capacity that is beyond like what a child's capacity is, right? You should learn wudu and study it also as like a teenager, as an adult, and keep revisiting certain things. So you're building relationships with it. And sometimes there's a gain that comes by engaging it when you're older, because you can then understand its meaning a lot differently. Do you know what I mean? Right, like my seven-year-old, when he was like four, or five and he's going through this wudu book, right? The kid's like looking at, it's it's like a, it, I love my son, don't get me wrong, right? I love my babies, they're amazing, mashallah. But you know, he's looking at this the way like if you study like pre-med, 
and you're staring at a bio book like this is crazy what does any of this mean he's looking at this thing that's got like one sheet of paper it's got a giant hand on it, it says hand and he's staring at it and then looking at the water like to be like what do i you know he's like really intense right what's he gonna think he's five he's four that's like where he's at right if you learned wudu at that time and somebody said to you here's this hadith that tells you that your limbs will glisten on the day of judgment well if i said that to my son what's he gonna even think do you get what i mean it removes like the spiritual aspect of it when at that point in time and it's not even further upon you right we'll talk about this next time like who is it incumbent upon to do wudu a little kid is not required to do wudu they're children you are required to do wudu if you're muslim you're post pubescent right other factors that go into it that we'll talk about but like little babies they don't have to do it so when they learn it at that age like it doesn't even allow for them they don't have the capacity to think about it differently do you get what i mean yeah go ahead um just a clarification on what you briefly mentioned regarding the left hand yeah in the hanafi school do you only use the left hand to clean both of your feet yeah okay and then just a question referring to the brother's question earlier Say, for example, I'm making wudu in a sink where there's running water. Mm -hmm. Is it preferable for me, say, when I'm washing my arms, to actually have my whole arm go under the, rotting wa the running water three times? Yep. Or is it acceptable to have a scoop full of my hand of water and then wash and then scoop and then wash three times? Yeah, you could do it. I mean, it's fundamentally still the same it's thing, the same, right? right? But okay. because you have the luxury of, like, running water, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Then, like, run your arm underneath it, do you know? and allow for yourself to have more gain from it. You know what I'm saying? Versus like, you know, it's a, it's a blessing for us. You know, there's not, a, there's not a, a gain to saying, I have to make it more difficult on myself in that way. Like the sink is there, like put your arm underneath it. If it works for you differently, by doing like this method where the water, as long as you can like still have it kind of be in the washing mode, then it, it suffices. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, let's say that you're making wudu and you forget the amount of times that you, you know, like, wash your arm, for example. Like, you think it's three times, but you, you might have been, but it might, have, but it might have been two. Do you assume two and then do another? Like, yeah, one? in our fiqh, not in Hanafi fiqh, just in Islam more generally, the default is if you kind of forget, then you want to do more than less, right? So if like, I'm doing tawaf of the Kaaba, and I have to do seven circuits walking around the Kaaba for a pilgrimage, and I don't know, did I do six, did I do seven, right? And you're kind of in that place, then the default is you should do one more rather than leaving it less. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Right, so, you know, here, like, but, but the idea is different than like, Man, you know what? If three is good, I just should do it seven times, right? No, like you, just, you don't do it seven times. You do it three times. That's what the prophet did. If you did it once or twice, it also suffices because once is enough. But you, you're not like adding to it by saying that this is somehow going to be increased because I did it like 11 times, you know? Like, no, it's just you do it the way that it's intended to be done. If you lose track of it, then you're going to do more than less, right? And that's like applicable in our prayer, like in other things. Um, here also, so wasting water is disliked. When you're washing your face, you don't want to slap your face with the water, right? You're washing your face. You're not slapping the face, right? This is like, and you think about it. When you're a little kid and you learn how to wash your face, you know, and you take like bar soap and you rub your face on it and then you're washing your face, like little kids slap their faces. Do you know what I mean? You ever seen a little kid wash their face, right? You know they slap their faces, right? Yeah, so don't do that when you're making wudu. That's, that's something that you shouldn't be doing. You're washing your face when you're making wudu. And then uh, you wanna um, also just use like 
one set of water when you're wiping your head. And this is what goes into making will do, right? Okay. Does this make sense? Right? And you just think about it. I, I'm, I don't know how, I've never like looked at any of you make will do before. Do you know what I mean? I don't go in the bathroom and like, oh, let me watch somebody make their will do. I, I don't know how you do it. You want to just take your time with it. And you don't want to be in a place where there is any notion of, you know, kind of shame or embarrassment, right? It's an exercise, just like any exercise. You want to treat it like an exercise. The more you engage it, the more you're going to build a relationship with it. The idea is to just have presence throughout it as best as you can and to recognize that there might be different ways that some people do different things. That the bathroom or the place where like the restroom is, is essentially going to be based off of how you're using it at that time. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, because I was told like you just, you say the, you say the uh, before you go into the bathroom because like, well, where I'm from they say you talk in the bathroom. You're not supposed to talk when yeah, you're using so the bathroom, right? Good. But like if you go for a hajj, for example, and you're staying like in the tents that are the no frill tents, right? The bathroom is like built in the same kind of compartment stall as the shower. Like it's all in one thing. There's a toilet and then there's the shower head, like right on top of you. Do you know what I mean? It's all there. Maximizing space and efficiency. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If it sounds like it's gross, just wait till you use it. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, go ahead. I, I don't know if you already addressed this, but I remember the week before you left for city and you had mentioned that um, you were wearing um, water imperative clothes. Yeah, we're going to talk about that right now. Oh. Yeah, so what you're going to find when you look online are different opinions that come up quite often, like in reference to your feet and your socks. Right? So in most of the opinions that you'll find, if you, there's, there's uh, an exemption to washing your feet if you are what's called a resident of a place, right? So there's like two categories that you can be as an individual. You're a resident, like this is your hometown, right? Or you're a traveler, right? You are somebody who has gone X amount of miles in the Hanafi school. It's like 48 and a half miles from a city limit. And you are traveling uh, to a designated area for like, you know, less than 15 days. You're a traveler, right? Those two categories affect the impact of the amount of time. If you're a resident for 24 hours, and if you're a traveler for up to 72 hours, you can perform wudu as we described, and then cover your foot with what is an acceptable like footwear that you can then wipe over that, as opposed to washing over your foot in full. Now where the different opinions lie are in what is a valid thing to actually wipe over. When you go online, you'll see people making wudu. Some people will have socks that are just like regular socks, right? I have a regular sock. Somebody will say, you can just wipe over this regular sock. There's different basises to these things. In the Hanafi school, this kind of sock does not work. You cannot wipe over this sock and it counts for your wudu. Of the four schools of thought in Sunni Islam that are kind of constituting the canonical schools and in what we would identify as more like Salafi Islam, right? You have the opinion that you can wipe over this sock and that suffices. What the requirement is in the Hanafi school is that what you're wearing has to go above the ankle it's got to be something that is waterproof. There's no kind of holes in it. It's not torn up or anything. So the water can't seep through it. Nothing else can seep through it. You can walk a certain distance in it without it tearing apart also. And that would suffice. 
these socks, which are essentially like camping socks, you can go online, their the brand is called Wudu Gear, right? And they suffice. You can get these in different colors, black, brown, navy, whatever. They're socks and they work. What people literally did because of the prevalence of different opinions was they were in places like Jordan and elsewhere, different Mashaikh got different brands of socks and tested them to see like, would they work? If I walked this much distance in it, will it tear? Is it permeable in some capacity? These kinds of things. So what I would say is if you are in this place, right? I travel a lot. I was just in Turkey. I was, you know, near the northern border of Syria. It's like a war zone over there right now. I got to still pray. I wore my Tim's. Not only because I like wearing my Tim's. People are like, why do you wear Tim's so much? I got used to wearing them when I was younger, but also because I travel so much these days, right? And I'm traveling across time zones. I'm on an airplane. You think it's hard to like stick your foot in a sink over here. Some of these airplanes, man, the bathrooms are like this small. And if you try to like stick your finger in something, you're definitely gonna like fall into the toilet in some way, right? So the Tim, the boot, like many of the boots that you have in women's fashion, even some in men's fashion, they will suffice. And what you will do is you put the shoe on, you put on like the wudu gear sock, and then for 24 hours, you can wipe over this. But if you take off the sock, then you can't do it. You know what I mean? Like it's gotta stay on it's not something that you you remove meaning like you broke your wudu and you went to the bathroom you took off the shoe you took off the sock you're not in a state of wudu you have to keep it on throughout that process does that make sense what i'm saying right say i'm wearing my boot um on my flight to turkey and i like go use the bathroom which is one of the ways you break wudu and I then come to my seat and I'm feeling like really hot and I take off my boot, then it doesn't work. I have to redo my wudu in entirety and then put the shoe back on and then a new 24 hours starts. Does that make sense? It's gotta stay on throughout that 24 hour period. And whether I break my wudu while I have it on or not is like, it's fine. I, I can redo my wudu and then I'm just wiping over like the, the, the shoe. I'm wiping over the sock. Does that make sense? But this is a special kind of sock. It's not like the sock that most of us are wearing right now, unless by chance you're wearing like a wudu gear sock, right? And these are like a different kind of like durability. If you ever go camping, you know, kind of mountain climbing, these are the kind of things that they've done um, in accordance to the Sunni tradition. Like it's been vetted by people who are of every like legal school of thought and it creates like a different ease that's why you want to have a strategy to your day right the goal isn't to say well i'm just going to get through my day by doing x y or z things right you can adopt certain practices that make it easier if you see somebody or you yourself are wiping over just a regular cotton sock there is a basis and an evidence for this you don't want to get into the habit where you start to assess and judge other people's practices. I used to be a writing TA when I was an undergrad here at one of the CUNY colleges in New York and New York City Technical College. It's right across the street from Tandon. People have gone to Tandon. And they had a prayer room there. And I was teaching in the middle of the winter. It was snowing like crazy. I went into the restroom and made wudu and I did a complete wudu, just like how we wrote out here. And I went into the prayer room to pray. And their musallah was like much smaller than our space. So I want you to picture it in your head, right? It's maybe like 10, 20% of the size of this room. And there's a guy who is sitting on the ground, like just looking at me. And then somebody comes in and we prayed dhuhr together. And then when we were done praying dhuhr, 
The guy who is sitting against the wall said to the guy who prayed with me in Urdu that this guy's prayer doesn't count. He's wearing his socks and he wiped over his socks and his wudu isn't valid, which makes his prayer not valid. And he led you in prayer, so your prayer is not valid. So then I started talking to him in Urdu. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then his mouth dropped because he thought I was like some white boy that couldn't understand what he was saying. And I was like, I understand very much so. And he was like, I'm so sorry, brother. I was like, you should be sorry, right? <laughs> but like, mind your business. Do you know what I mean? And there's a certain etiquette to understanding how diverse opinions function. You want to be in a place where you have a respect for these kinds of things. You're not like the police of anybody, nor is there like absolute perspective that says this way is fundamentally the only way. Do you know? You don't want to get into that habit, not even for the sake of the person whose heart you might potentially hurt, but in the place where like it creates now a very subtle mode, may Allah protect us from it of arrogance, that somehow, like, what is it? This guy didn't even talk to me, you know? And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking? And I was like, you're even, if, I was like, forget everything else. You're wrong, man. I stuck my foot in that sink in the cold, cold water and the snowy weather that we're in. Like, and who are you to like say that I didn't do it? You didn't even see that it happened. You get what I mean, right? Don't be that person, right? The idea isn't that you sit and you think about this. How can you have mindfulness in your wudu if you're watching somebody else to see if their wudu is not being done properly? And when there's real love, there's muhabba, right? And this is something that's important to understand. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he had this with some of his companions, with all of them. And he was able to tell them certain things, right? Umar ibn al-Khattab, who's a senior companion of the Prophet, the Prophet tells him, you will not have faith, complete faith, until you love me more than you love your uh, parents, your children, and your own self. And the Prophet, and Omar says, I love you, Ya Rasulullah, more than, you know, all of these people, but not more than myself. And the Prophet says, this is part of like the completion of your faith. And Omar radiallahu anhu goes and he thinks about this, right? He wouldn't have Islam if it wasn't for the Prophet. Like all these people wouldn't have this different insight that you don't murder your daughters. You treat people of all races with dignity and respect. You have a certain understanding of social equity and justice, right? There's a certain kind of elevation and graciousness towards just humanity that you share with people simply because they're people. And he goes back and he says to the prophet, like now I love you even more than I love me. And the Prophet says to him, now your faith is complete, right? The Prophet is telling his friend something about just the state of his faith. But they're close friends. Do you know what I mean? Right? If you walked up to some random person, most of you don't even know each other in this room. Somebody came up to you and was like, man, your faith is not complete. You're like, what? First of all, you sound like you say ablutions, right? Who talks like this? <laughs> and who are you to tell me something about me when you don't even know my name? If you get to the level where you have that closeness to somebody, like the Prophet had to Umar, then you can get to a place where you can get deep and you want to have real love with somebody as you're giving them advice and counsel so that you know how it is that they're gonna be recipient of that advice and counsel. You're not just throwing words at people to be like, I'm just gonna tell you like this little nugget of information that I know. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? And it can create like real challenges and problems, right? You just have to know that there's different opinions on some of these things. And one of those things that'll come up and will do is like wiping over your socks, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. It is 8.45. We didn't do this, which I wanted us to do, but this took a little longer than I thought it would. It seems like there were some things that everybody was picking up on. Just like sit on it 
And when you're making wudu, you don't have to make wudu only when you're about to pray, right? So some of the things that you want to understand, if you've made wudu and you've had wudu all day, then you've had wudu all day, right? I've had wudu all day, alhamdulillah. Somebody told me I look like I'm well fed. I just didn't eat anything today, you know? I didn't break my wudu in that sense. Like when I fast on some days, I'm not necessarily breaking my wudu. You can make your wudu once and it lasts for the whole day and you're good with it. The next time we meet, we'll talk about some of the specifics, what nullifies the wudu, what breaks it. We're gonna talk about a different type of washing that is called the ghusl, which you take a shower and what necessitates that. One of the things that I'd encourage you to try to do Try to be in wudu as much as you can. Don't be paranoid with it, right? If you have like kind of health concerns, physiologically you can't do it. But if you use the restroom, try to make wudu after. You wake up in the morning, try to make wudu, right? To be in a state of wudu, it's a purified state. You know, there's a certain element metaphysically that is good from being in that state. And when you're trying to practice, don't practice like mindlessly. Go home today and say, hey, do I do it in this way, right? Because some of us aren't even going to know. You're going to go through it and you're going to catch yourself. Like as you're doing each limb, you're going to be like, whoa, I wasn't doing it in that way. Or you can pat yourself on the back and be like, yeah, I did this really great. Yay for me. Good job. But when you're doing it and it's the middle of the day, it's like... 15 minutes of a lunch break, or you're in between classes, you want to practice this when there's no kind of time constraints on it. Do you get what I mean? Right, like you spend some time with the form of it that's not attached to, I only have five minutes left for Fajr, and I'm gonna sit and try to like practice wudu at that time. Does that make sense? Yeah? All right, so I go.